Okay, we are continuing in our study of Ephesians, and we'll be in chapter 3 this morning, verses 7 through 13. I just wanted to say, uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed most about our weekly gatherings is the time that we have to sing. I had no idea before we started Ephesians that a number of songs that teach these truths, and to me it's been really enjoyable to sing those together. Appreciate Matt and Hannah and Susanna and Elsie Grace uh, leading us each week. So uh, that's been a real blessing to me personally. Last week we began our study of this digression that Paul started in chapter 3 and verse 2. It really was prompted by his mentioning himself as the prisoner of the Lord. And in in this digression he's explaining the mystery of Christ as Jew and Gentile in one body and the equality that they share and privilege, as well as his role in dispensing that mystery. He's an apostle to the Gentiles. He's also one of the foundation stones in the church. We looked at Paul's status as a prisoner of the Lord last week, that he was under house arrest in Rome because of the Gentiles and because of his preaching preaching directly to the Gentiles. We also looked at his explanation of the mystery of Christ, including his responsibility to dispense that mystery, when and to whom that mystery was revealed. Remember, we talked about the fact that in the Old Testament, the church was completely unknown. This is a brand new thing. That's what mystery means. It was something hidden by God himself for all these ages until Pentecost, and even then, after it was revealed, it took some time for even the apostles to understand what it was. But we now have that. We have that revealed, not only to those first generation believers, but to us. The teaching of the, of the apostles has been preserved in scripture for us in the New Testament. And, and we're the beneficiaries of, as well as the first century Gentiles. We saw again that the content of that mystery was the fact that we are fellow heirs as Gentiles with the Jews in the kingdom of God. We're fellow members of his body and have equal standing and we're fellow partakers of the promise of, uh, which is in Christ Jesus and all the spiritual blessings that that includes. Paul's been talking about that a lot as we've been working through the letter to the Ephesians. So what we want to do now is in chapter 3 again read verses 1 through 13 and we'll be focusing this morning on verses 7 through 13. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there were made known to me the mystery, as as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, The very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages had been hidden in God who created all things in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. So again, from last week, we looked at verses 2 through 6. Paul finished his discussion of the mystery itself and what it was. Now he's going to talk about his placement into the ministry and the attending responsibility that he has to impart his knowledge of the mystery to the Gentiles. So we'll break our passage this morning up into four parts. Paul's placement into the ministry in verses 7 through 8a. Paul's performance of the ministry in verses 8b through 9. The purpose of that ministry in verses 10 through 12. And then finally Paul's prohibition in light of his digression, his digression in verse 13. So let's look first at Paul's placement into the ministry. At the end of verse 6, Paul said it was through the gospel that the Gentiles had become fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ. 
And it is that gospel of which Paul has been made a minister. It's, he says a minister or a servant. Diakonos is the Greek word there. He doesn't talk about himself as an apostle in this context because he recognizes that he's a servant of the Lord. And he is committed to God's commands. This is not a position that Paul sought on his own initiative. It was God who turned him around and put him into his service. Of course, this happened at Paul's conversion. Even as he was seeking letters to have Christians in the synagogues of Damascus put to death. You recall that the Lord personally appeared to Paul. He struck him blind. And then he told him to proceed on into Damascus. That's where he was headed already. And that he would be told what to do when he got there. Paul did not eat or drink for three days. And during that time the Lord appeared to a disciple, to Ananias. And gave him instructions on what to say to Paul and to heal him from his blindness. We pick up that account in Acts chapter 9. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to thy saints in Jerusalem. Paul's reputation had preceded him. He was known as a persecutor of Christians, and Ananias, quite frankly, was afraid of him. How much harm he did to thy saints in Jerusalem, and here, here in Damascus, he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon thy name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. That's an excellent summary of Paul's ministry. That's what we see him doing in the rest of the book of Acts. We know him as the apostle to the Gentiles, but he always went into the synagogues of the Jews first. They were the ones who knew the Old Testament scriptures. They were the ones who should have been best prepared to hear the message of Messiah. So he went to them first. They, a few believed, certainly, but oftentimes he was rejected and had to run, and then he would go to the Gentiles. Of course, he eventually gets arrested, and that just gives him an opportunity to bear witness to Christ before all these authorities in the Roman government. He says, the Lord does, in verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias obeys the Lord and heals Saul. He finally eats, and then he's baptized as a believer in Christ. Pick up that account again in verse 19. Now for several days, he, Paul, was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And again, you can imagine what this must have been like for them. This was a man who was adamantly opposed to Christ and his followers. Now all of a sudden he's meeting with them, and he's agreeing with them that Jesus is the Christ. Immediately, Paul began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Son of God, of course, being another title for the Messiah. It goes back to the Davidic covenant and the fact that God said to David that his descendants would be a son to him and he would be a father to the son. So he's recognizing Jesus as that Messiah. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on the name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? But Saul, another name for Paul, kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus. Again, most of those were not believing that Jesus was the Christ by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So now back in Ephesians 3, Paul explains that God put him into service according to his grace and according to his power. Certainly it was according to grace because Paul was not doing anything to merit this role. In fact, he was doing everything he could to oppose Christ and his followers. But because of that, he could not have been a stronger example of God's grace. God's grace to change the course of his life. It also took the working of God's power to convert Paul the way that he did and to make such a strong opponent of the gospel into such a strong proponent of it. He kept him by his power, faithfully serving even when it brought him tremendous hardship. Paul talks about this in his second letter to the Corinthians. Remember, this was a letter that was written on Paul's third missionary journey before he was arrested in Jerusalem, before he had spent the last four years in prison, two in Caesarea and two in Rome. And he detailing in 2 Corinthians all that he had already gone through, even before his most recent trouble. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Remember, Paul is having to defend his ministry even at this point in it. 
and he's defending against others who are saying that he's not an apostle. He says, are they servants of Christ? And he's talking about his detractors there. I speak as if insane. I'm more so in far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. We've, we know about one of those. It's recorded for us in Scripture. Some of these are not recorded anywhere else. So we don't have the detail on them. But Paul is explaining to us all that he's been through as an apostle of Christ. I've been on frequent, frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, the Jews, Dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. Uh, he went through all these physical difficulties but he had the, the mental load of caring for people, caring for all these different churches that he established across the Roman Empire. And yet, by the power of God in him, Paul not only endured these things, he overwhelmingly conquered. Not so much so that at the end of his ministry he could say when he's arguably in the most difficult position he's been in. Remember, when he writes 2 Timothy, he's in a dungeon, he knows he's gonna be executed. A very difficult situation, very different from the house arrest that he was under at Rome. And yet, here's what he says. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, Paul was not... Uh, he was not second-guessing anything at all about Christ. He was not in any way pessimistic about his future, even though he was locked up in a prison cell. He knew that God would reward him, and he knew there were better things yet to come. Ephesians 3, verse 8, To me, the very least of all saints, Paul says, this grace was given. We talked about this some last week. Why would Paul consider himself the least of all saints? Exactly. I mean, that's what we've already been talking about. The fact that he was a strong opponent of the church. And that's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 these various appearances that Christ made after he was resurrected. He says, last of all, as it, as it were to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles. Remember he says the least of the saints in the earlier in, in Ephesians 3, here are the least of the apostles who am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He spells that out more in 1 Timothy 1. And again, I think 1 Timothy 1 gives us some real insight into why Christ chose Paul in particular to be the apostle to the Gentiles. 1 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful or trustworthy, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. And yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. So he not only saw himself as the least of the saints, but the foremost of sinners. And yet, for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me as the foremost, the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe for eternal life. So uh, when you see the example of God's power and God's grace towards somebody who was so strongly opposed to Christ, it, it does help you appreciate the grace of God more. And Paul sees that uh, in his own life. Paul was a man of great humility on the one hand, but he knew that God had done this in his life. He knew that God had chosen him and put him into service 
and he wants to be faithful to fill the role that God's given him to God's glory. It's a good example to all of us. We certainly aren't all the Apostle of Paul. There was only one of those guys. And God chose him and gifted him for a particular role. But he does that with each of us as well. He chooses us. He puts us in particular places of service. He gifts us according to, according to his own will, but certainly also according to the needs of a particular body. And he puts us together. And we just want to have the same attitude that Paul had in using the gifts that God's given us and recognizing that he's put us in certain places of service, both in the church and in the community at large, and be faithful to live for him. The rest of verse, verses 8 and 9 provide the two-pronged approach to Paul's performance of his ministry. The last part of verse 8 lead, reads literally, to the Gentiles to proclaim as good news the unfathomable riches or wealth would be another way to translate that word of Christ. So the wealth of Christ there is said to be unfathomable. That means there's no way that we can understand all the depth that it has. I think we spend the rest of our lives as Christians growing in that knowledge and growing in our appreciation for all that God has done for us in Christ. Certainly it includes such things as the spiritual blessings that Paul spelled out in Ephesians chapter 1, the great mercy and love that God has demonstrated towards us in Christ, God's wisdom and knowledge as granted to us in the Word of God, all things that God has given us even freely in this life to enjoy. Tremendous blessing that we have as Christians. Again, not excluding the fact that we go through trials and difficulties, that God uses those to sanctify us in the truth, but also because of the change of perspective that comes when we come to accept Christ and recognize Him as our Lord and Savior, we know that there's life beyond this life. And that really, I think, helps us to enjoy the things that we have in this life, the good things that come from God. We have hope and assurance of life beyond the grave in a new creation that's no longer under the curse. Paul proclaimed this wealth of Christ to both Jews and Gentiles. He did that on three different missionary journeys in cities and islands across the Roman Empire. If you just look at a map of Paul's missionary journeys, it's incredible. I mean, this is a day where travel is not nearly as easy as it is for us, but he covered the Roman Empire, and he was always looking to go to those places where Christ had not yet been named. He did all that despite continual opposition against him and plots on his life. I mean, that was what he was detailing back in 2 Corinthians. His primary assignment, as we've said, was to the Gentiles. It's placed first in this uh, verse, in verse 8, for emphasis. But again, that didn't prevent him from going to the Jews first. He did that in every city that had a synagogue, and most of them did at that point. Remember, as part of the dispersion, the synagogue, synagogues came into being, and most of the cities across the Roman Empire had one. He took advantage, Paul did, of every opportunity, even even evangelizing the Praetorian guards that were assigned to him when he was under house arrest in Rome. And of course, during this time, during his ministry, he wrote 13 letters that have been preserved for us in the New Testament. And they continue to preach to us as believers and to people all over the world of the unfathomable wealth of Christ. Every Gentile believer in history, and that includes us, owes a debt of gratitude to the Apostle Paul, both for his faithful ministry of the gospel and the example of his life. I mean, Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Secondly, the second prong of Paul's performance of his ministry was to enlighten the administration of the mystery. That's what verse 9 says, to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Now think about what that means. God ordained the church as Jew and Gentile in one body and chose its members before he created anything else. We saw that back in chapter 1. This is especially significant because as the creator of all things, God only brought the creation into being after planning the, the ages themselves and the redemption that would follow, including the mystery of the church. Paul's reminder that God is the creator of all things emphasizes the power that God himself has to accomplish what he planned. He ordained the church within the Godhead and kept it secret from everyone else, even the angels, through all the ages of time. 
He revealed it only after the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. And again, Paul talks about this in another place in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, we, talking about himself and his fellow apostles, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it, as it is written, things which eye have not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. He revealed it to the Apostle Paul, among the other apostles and prophets, that they might make it known to the rest of us. And that's what he means when he says here to bring to light or to pull away the cover from what was once a mystery, the administration of the mystery of Jew and Gentile in one body. That's what Paul did. He did it in his own day through face-to-face -face teaching as he traveled to these different cities. He did it through his letters, both to the contemporary believers of his day and to every believer that would follow. Making this mystery known and making it clear was a driving force in Paul's ministry. Remember, he talked about this already back in Ephesians 1. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that's the same verb that's used in chapter 3, verse 9, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. He's going to talk about it again in chapter 3 when we get down to verses 18 and 19. So it's, it's, it's something that drives Paul is to make this mystery clear and, and to make it known to as many Gentiles as he can. I want to take a little digression of my own here and just help us think about where we stand in the plan of God. We've been reading in Ephesians about these various ages that God has planned out before he even created the first thing. And do you ever think about how fortunate we are to stand where we do in the plan of God? I mean, we live in an age where we have the complete revelation of God. We have it in our own language. It's very easily accessible to us. We can see things more clearly because of where we stand in history. It's always uh, better as you live further down the road to look back and see what God has done. It's always easier to see what he's done, both in the church and in the nation of Israel. God certainly is preserving Israel. We can look in our own day and see how God is preserving Israel as his people, just like he said he would in the Old Testament. Now, they're being preserved in unbelief right now, but we recognize that those same people, or a portion of them one day, will have their eyes open to recognize Christ as their Messiah. We see how he continues to build the church today around the world. You know, there's more solid Bible teaching I know we, we think about how many churches aren't doing that, and that's true, but there's an awful lot of solid Bible teaching available all over the world today, even by means of technology. You can hear good, solid Bible teaching in a way that you, you couldn't in previous generations. That's the work of God. We also recognize that there's nothing left to be fulfilled of what God has promised before Christ returns. So we talk about the imminence of the return of Christ. Uh, that's what it means. There's nothing else left to, to be fulfilled before he comes back. We even have the book of Revelation. Think about this. Paul didn't have that. He didn't have all the detail that we have concerning Christ's return, the judgments that will come, the rapture of the church that will precede those judgments, and just kind of the, the timeline of events uh, Paul had access to those events themselves, or at least to the prophecies in the Old Testament. He knew the kinds of things that were going to happen when Christ came back, but I don't think he had access to the book of Revelation that was written after he died, and, and we have that today. So I guess what I hope more than anything that that does is motivate you to study the Word of God, to know as much as you can about what God has revealed in His plan. And, and that's kind of a driving and important principle for us as a church is not just to study the New Testament. We, we will spend a great deal of time doing that, but really to try to understand the whole counsel of God. We can better understand the New Testament if we know what the Old Testament says. In fact, the New Testament writers assume that you know the Old Testament as they write to you. 
Paul's explained that he's been placed in this ministry of the gospel with God's enabling grace so that he might preach the unsearchable wealth of Christ and enlighten both Jew and Gentile concerning the mystery which has been hidden in God. And he continues to do that even for us today through his letters in the New Testament. Now he moves to describe the purpose of his ministry in verses 10 through 12. And the first part of that is to make God's wisdom known to the angelic rulers. Remember, this is something too that Paul has touched on already in his letter. Back in chapter 1, Paul spoke of how God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. We, when we looked at that, we talked about how the, those kinds of terms are used in a number of places in the New Testament to describe the angelic powers, those unseen powers that are in the heavenly places. He's going to use those same terms again in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now in that context, he's clearly talking about those fallen angels, those forces and angelic rulers that oppose Christ. I don't think we can limit that to, to just the evil angels in chapter 3. I think here he's talking about both good and evil angels. Verse 10 again says, In order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Now this wisdom that he's talking about, uh, generally speaking, wisdom is insight into facts. It's a, the ability to, to have knowledge and understanding of facts and, and know what their significance is. Of course, you can have human wisdom that's passed from one generation to the next. Uh, we even have sayings or proverbs that encapsulate that kind of wisdom. It's a common wisdom, kind of common sense in some, in some ways. It comes from observation. And that's a good thing, that kind of wisdom it is. It helps us and guides us in life. But the best wisdom that we can get comes from God. And that's because it provides insight into ultimate real reality, into the way things truly are, and into the true nature of God's plan. Here's the way that Harold Honer summarizes this wisdom. This wisdom that Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 3. In past history, God, in his wisdom, has dealt with humankind in a variety of ways. For example, his dealings with people before Abraham differed from his dealings after he made a covenant with Abraham. And again, this ties into the, those ages of time and, and kind of dispensations of God's revelation of himself through time. Likewise, there was another change when Israel became a nation under Moses. Accordingly, in this New Testament era, the unification of believing Jews and Gentiles into one body is another change. Therefore, the manifold wisdom of God must refer to this mystery, which Paul's been explaining from chapter 2, verse 11 to the present verse. That's what we're talking about in the manifold wisdom of God, is the way that he has unveiled his plan through time. What's especially fascinating here in Ephesians 3 is the process that it's that this revelation of wisdom goes through. Verse 9 speaks of the mystery which was for ages hidden in God. It includes being hidden even from the angels. Paul's saying here that through the church and on the earth, God's manifold wisdom is now being made known to the angelic powers that are in the heavenlies. In other words, Paul and the church got the, revel got the revelation of the mystery before the angels themselves did. We don't normally think that way, right? We normally think of God communicating to the angels and the angels communicating to men. That's what the word angel means. It's a messenger of God. But in this case, this mystery was hidden from angels. And it was revealed first to Paul. Paul made it known to others. And the angels observe and grow in their wisdom of what God has done through the church. Evidently, the praise of God that the angels are really uh, doing all the time is enhanced by their knowledge of this mystery as they learn it through the church. Here's the way that MacArthur talks about this. The church does not exist simply for the purpose of saving souls, though that is a marvelous and important work. The supreme purpose of the church, as Paul makes explicit here, 
is to glorify God by manifesting his wisdom before the angels, who can then offer greater praise to God. The purpose of the universe is to give glory to God. We read about that in Psalm 148 this morning. And, th and that will be its ultimate rea reality after all evil is conquered and destroyed. The church is not an end in itself, but a means to an end, the end of glorifying God. The real drama of redemption can only be understood when we realize the glory of God is the supreme goal of creation. Holy angels are especially made and confirmed in purity and praise as creatures who will glorify God forever. And the redemption of fallen men enriches that praise. Redeemed people then are to enhance angelic praise and someday in heaven to join in it. It's not, I don't think that's something we think about very often, but the angels are learning uh, the mystery of the church through us as we live it out on the earth. That helps us, I think, understand a passage like 1 Peter 1, where he says, Peter does in verse 10, as to this salvation, the prophets, and he's talking about the Old Testament prophets here, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Again, these Old Testament prophets understood that the Messiah was going to suffer and then to be glorified, and they were looking for that person and the time at which that person was going to be revealed. They didn't know who that was going to be. It was revealed to these prophets that they were not serving themselves, but you, that is, later generations, in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then he says this, things into which angels long to look. Now think about that. Angels can experience salvation experientially right the the good angels don't need it because they haven't fallen so they don't need to be saved and the bad angels can't get it they've always been well once they fell they're confirmed in their fallenness and they can't be saved but evidently i think both sides good and bad angels learn of the wisdom of god as they observe the mystery of christ as it is evidenced in the church on the earth MacArthur talks about how the good angels enhance, or their praise is enhanced by this knowledge. What about the evil angels? What does, let me throw this out as a real question, what does the church as, and the revelation of the church, what impact does that have on the evil angels? It hurts their efforts. It, uh, they understand that God has done something that opposes them. They would, they would have loved for the enmity between Jew and Gentile to have continued, right? They would have loved for the enmity of both groups, between both groups and God to have continued. But they recognize now, as they observe the church, as Jew and Gentile in one body, in harmony and unity with, with one another, that that is a blow to their program. They can't stop God's eternal purpose in Christ. And that brings us to verse 11. God's purpose accomplished in Christ. Verse 11 says that all this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's eternal purpose here speaks to his planning in eternity past to bring the church about after it was hidden for so many ages. Much of what Ephesians as a whole is talking about is God's ordaining and overseeing this accomplishment of his purpose and plan of redemption. He established that plan before time and he's now bringing it about and fulfilling it through time. We saw references to God's purpose a couple of times back in Ephesians 1. He said in verse 9, the Father made known to us the mystery of his will, which in, according to his kind intention, he purposed in Christ. Then in verse 11, in Christ also we were made an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, which works, who works all things after the counsel of his will. It's important, I think, for us to recognize that though the church was not revealed until Pentecost, it was hidden through all those ages, God planned for and established it before the foundation of the world. It, it's what makes up part of his multifaceted wisdom, and it, it's also part of his multi, multifaceted plan of redemption. 
Of course, the accomplishment of God's purpose was only possible through the work of Christ. His conquering of sin and death on the cross is the very basis of the church. It's what enabled God to remove the enmity between Jew and Gentile and to remove the enmity between both groups and himself. God's raising Christ from the dead and seating him at his right hand as ruler over all and making him of the head of the church, all this is a demonstration even to the hostile rulers of this age and the authorities that they are done. It's true that they're still active today and they're still doing all they can to turn people away from the true God. But the battle really has already been won. And we're just waiting for the full manifestation of Christ when he returns. In the meantime, verse 12 says that it's through this same Christ that we now have access to the Father. This is yet another concept that Paul has talked about. I, I think I mentioned this last week. A lot of chapter 3 is picking up and reminding us of truth that he's already talked about in earlier chapters. Back in 2.18 he said, It is through Christ that we both, believing Jew and Gentile, have our access in one spirit to the Father. And here in chapter 3 verse 12 he's saying that it's in Christ that we have boldness and confident access through faith in Him. This is something we didn't have before we became believers, but we now have it through faith in Christ. We can come before God in prayer freely and openly making our requests known to Him. We have even a certain boldness. And I think there's some Old Testament examples that help us to illustrate this. Can you think of Old Testament characters that you would say were bold with God? Just Moses. Moses is a good example, right? You know, there's certain Moses spoke with God face to face. And there were certain things where, you know, he was just very candid with God. And he knew God well. I think that was the reason he was able to do that. What's another character that we think about? Abraham. Abraham was another one. Uh, he, he just very candid in his prayers with God and very <coughs> unafraid to make his request known to God. David is another one that we think about. We have this uh, tremendous record of his, of his prayers in many cases in the Psalms that he turned into songs. But he, all of these men uh, and others in the Old Testament had this kind of boldness because of their close relationship with God. And we have that same thing. Every one of us as Gentile believers have this kind of access to God in prayer. Hebrews 4 says, and Aaron actually alluded to this in his prayer this morning, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence, that's the same word that's used in Ephesians 3, to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. And the Apostle John says this in his uh, first letter, 1 John 5, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Now, this freedom of access to God doesn't mean that we are arrogant with God. It doesn't mean that we demand things from Him. Uh, we just have access to Him. We come to Him in humility. We come to Him knowing that He is a great God, that He knows what we need from Him even before we ask Him. And then we're frail human beings. We're the creatures and He's the Creator. But we do have uh, a confidence to come before Him. And we should have a boldness in the sense of, of being able to speak with him from our hearts openly. We come knowing that God does know everything about us, but also that he wants to hear from us. This is something that he's designed for us to have, is this access. He's the one that's made it possible. Okay, that brings us to verse 13, and this is kind of this is the very end of Paul's digression. And he actually gives a prohibition in light of that digression. He says in verse 13, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. The therefore, at the beginning there, helps us understand why Paul made this digression in the first place. He's drawing a conclusion from all that he has said since verse 2. His imprisonment and all that led up to it are the tribulations that he's referring to here. 
and his suffering on behalf of the Gent- he is suffering on ha- behalf of the Gentiles because as we saw last week, his ministry directly to the Gentiles is what got him in trouble and arrested in the first place. The fact that he was willing to endure such trouble and continue in his ministry to them and to us, even through this letter, should encourage the people that read this letter rather than discourage. We talked about last week how they could easily become discouraged because this one that had brought them the news of the gospel was now being arrested. And they're thinking, well, maybe this guy's not who he was cracked up to be. Well, he's saying no. His tribulations are their glory in the sense that they are the result of his ministry to the Gentiles, enabling those Gentiles to be new creatures in Christ. If you think about it in another way, if Paul had never carried out his ministry of the gospel to the Gentiles, including the Ephesians, he would not be in prison, and they would not know Christ. So their tribulations then should be a source of glory and gratitude, not grief for them. That ends Paul's digression. He's finally, in verse 14, going to get to the prayer that he started back in verse 1, and we'll look at that next week. It, it's a prayer uh, that we see occurring a couple of times in Ephesians The primary theme of that prayer is increased knowledge and spiritual maturity of all that God has already done for us. We don't really have to ask God to do more things for us. He's done so much for us already. What we need to understand is, uh, what we need to do is grow in in what we already have in Christ. We'll look at that passage next week. Let's have a word, a prayer together now. We'll have our our break time after. Father, we do indeed marvel and thank you for where we stand in the flow of your redemption. It's incredible to us that you've given us the revelation of your word all the way back, not just to creation, but even before creation. You revealed things that you planned within the Godhead and that you have brought about through history. We can look back and see how you've done that because we have the record of it in your word. We can look now and see what you're doing in the church, first through the lens of your word, but also through seeing it firsthand. We're eyewitnesses of Jew and Gentile in one body and the spread of the gospel across the globe and the unity that we can share as brothers and sisters in Christ with other people from other nations. Uh, we, can, we have many differences as, as a people, language and culture and customs, but as believers, We have a common faith, a common Lord, and we have unity and peace between us. Father, we thank you for the things that you've revealed to us in the book of Ephesians and how it helps us to understand what our identity in Christ is and the access that we have to you through Christ. Lord, I pray that we would not take that for granted, that we would take advantage of the access that we have to you through prayer, and that that prayer would be shaped and influenced by the truth that we read in your word. I thank you for the way that you're working in our lives, and I know that you are. I can see it in my own life. I see it in the lives of other people. To grow in our understanding of all the spiritual blessings that you've blessed us with in Christ. Lord, I just pray, as Paul did, that you would continue to do that, and that we would grow in the knowledge of of Christ until he comes for us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.